Hello everyone, this will be a fascinating lecture on possessions. It's a fragment of a chapter from a book called The Cultosophia about carrying the body and mind, mediumistic traces. I have walked with hidden saints. I have pondered with kings and queens of the past and worn their crowns as felt on the head for a moment with masters of antiquity and divine philosophers. I have enjoyed sensuality with the sacred prostitutes of the Babylonian temples that incarnated in my loved one and the devas of the Hindis. I have taught with magicians of bygone ages and elven spirits with vipers fierce and winged black. The doors of the hidden worlds opened before me. In complete silence I shared my body and mind with the condemned and the unfortunate, the mischievous and with the blissful and the divine. Artifexa, my girl, became a temple. So did the artifacts, that is, myself. Silently, in incarnation, we understood misery with the poor and downcast, appreciated the silence with the glorious and victorious. With this Spartan helmet and armor, once questioned, what do I want to do next? Appreciated silence with the glorious and victorious, with heroes of the times past, the spirits and the wretched of hells. We spoke silent, wordless speeches with the gods and the star brothers. With your souls, converse, and the souls of the animals in a unitary intelligibility. Saturn. Those who follow their destiny and know themselves are duly freed from the influence of the powers that rule the unconscious and animate them whenever such a need arises. They allow their stars and genius, their diamond, to animate them, for they are essentially one and the same. While the family of spirits guides them as a friend in the midst of the space like serenity and war. Sameness and otherness, nature, substance, inclination and form of all beings, with all the forces at play. It is more likely that the human world, our living mortal world, will be overshadowed by the other, disincarnate, dead or living side, that people will forge their own destinies. In the impasse, the human side distorts the other side in life and after death. And likewise, the other side influences human affairs to a greater extent than we think. There is a wedge between the top and the bottom, a wedge created for the purpose of blinding, as below, so in the middle, not as above. To get to the top, the heavens, the outer heavens, you have to penetrate through all the illusions, deceptions and citadels of masks that this blind world has created on both sides so that no truth or realization emerges. Apparently, sometimes it does. The citadel was built to leave it. You need luck or assistance from above. The consequences of letter, the river of immemory for the world and the people are indeed catastrophic. Ontology of being. Any being, an entity caught in the process of existence is either active passive, dormant or reactive to things. It thrives in its own environment and in its element according to its nature, which is defined as its most general characteristic of the whole, and the unique genii belonging to a species and related to that essence through the senses, which are defined as every point of contact, interface, between the being and reality in whatsoever state. It moves in its inclination according to its inner direction and outer movement within a given topology of itself, circumstances and the environment. Every being has its substance and the limit of its substance is its influence on the world. In other words, its impressions on itself and on the world. But the competence of its emergence, execution of its will and power, influence, unfolding, origin, impressions that it gives away or receives, whether intentional or unintentional, are defined by the flow of its being, either collectively, holistically, in many directions or unidirectionally, in projection, introjection or interprojection of these. Thus, being, an entity, is defined by the karmic entropy, karman 
inclination of the entire universal web which is also topologically diverse and can be defined by the totality of the contents between time, force, consciousness and the variables of all the listed parameters and attributes that describe the aspects, the declusion of all the hidden factors. Often the awareness of certain knowledge coupled with observation and self-knowledge, self-awareness, using a different perspective and point of view is enough to form a defensive mechanism against the onslaught, to preserve our own natures. It is also beneficial to know that non-human senses, let's treat a sense that is just an aggregate of contact between an experiencing experiencer and a given phenomena. There can be multiple ways to enter into such a relationship. And we have manifold senses, not just the physical senses, so do the invisible ethereal beings and entities. So intelligence can exist in this incarnate manner. Spirits are intelligent. They have their inclinations in nature. They don't need a brain or senses in the physical sense of mortals. But they'll still retain senses unknown to humans. To become master of one's body and mind, to know oneself and one's direction, is to be conscious. Nature can manifest its character only to the extent that our mental state, attitude, content, structure, feeling and the vastness of our mind and heart allows. According to our self-awareness, self-knowledge, introspection, observation, discipline and willful expression. They can also extend our natural substance, nature and inclinations to the extremes of their being, greatness or badness. The center is safe territory. The reason, the feeling and the intellect that select and discipline these extremes bring them into harmony of the middle way. As long as we do not engage in psychic assaults in defensive manner or aggressive manner, in which we are merely tools or puppets and also contradict, confront and know where we stand, so we define ourselves and expand our natures in confrontation, whether we receive assault or give them away. We can work with different intelligences for a specific goal, as the vastness and expanse of our mind can accommodate them and we sacrifice a part of ourselves so that natures of these spirits can manifest. We can establish ourselves as the living temples and masters of the house, of our body, mind and soul, in awareness of their presence, sensing them, their magnetism, their natures, discerning as long as we know ourselves and our own natures. Now the guests that visit our temples either abuse our temples and destroy our minds and souls by trying to violate it without permission, then they are cast out and exterminated, whereas they should be thrown out and some others that try to increase our abilities, our skills in a natural way fortifying our diamond, expressing it to the utterest of its glory and force, are our friends, and they respect the temple of our bodies, minds and souls. Now, some natures are attracted by the law of similarity. If you develop a nature, a nature may be attracted. Others, by the law of contrast and difference. If you are completely different, something may be attracted too. Others by the law of affect, still others by the law of aversion. If something hates you, it may be attracted. If something likes you, it may be attracted. Still others by the law of domination, they want to dominate you and turn your nature into their own. Others by the law of freedom, they want to liberate you. Some are attracted by similitude in nature, others antagonized by difference of nature. Still others are guided by choice and will and have an overt or hidden goal. Others by the mind's passivity or its steely purpose and goal. Still others by the inertia toward other goals. In this tension one progresses or takes a few steps backward in an alchemy of self-exploration to establish and refine one's image of the mind. As long as it does not fragment or become what is known as psychotic or decompensated. When the debris of the process consumes the mind and averts its process of self-healing, rounding and incorporating metopsychic equilibria into a greater vista of the world. Now the process of confrontation shapes the mind, 
when it is unidirectionally guided by an idea of what we want to become, our principles, our highest aspirations. There must always be a personality ideal or a mental image ideal to which we aspire. It is often only a trace, but it grows into fully fledged matter and matures and takes on reality and thickness as we progress throughout months and years. Without it, we fall apart without coordinates. To name a few personal coordinates, my personal are that of Res Publica, of the Romans, Via Romana, the Confucian order and cosmos, the Zionistic being in all instances of life, the Dharmic principle of compassion and kindness, the Greek delight in philosophy and elegant theorizing, Paideic oikumene, the romantic Germanic flow of rapturous ideals, the Arabic feriosity and martial resilience, the lightness and sanctity of the Drotars, the Druids, the sensual pitching and mastered sublimity of Pythagoreans, the native love of nature, and the Egyptian of affirmation of life and magic, the Akkadian reverence for the depths of the universe and the profundity of it. These and many other cultures and civilizations produce both men and women of great stature and value, and likewise, through natural human weaknesses and misguidance, produced individuals who turned against their own and brought about their ruin. The examples can be multiplied, but they must be selected, assimilated, affirmed, authenticated, understood, seen through, taught out, and matured. The wisdoms and principles of the ancients are not cast aside, but left to all those who penetrate their mysteries and at least try to live them out, to keep them in their hearts. The cult of the mind should not replace the more tender openness to idea, consciousness, feeling and their transformations, for the mind is merely a vehicle of the sixth sense. When attachment to this sense becomes too strong, attachment to the mind itself, we suffer harm when it turns against us, or we lose self-conscious qualities we took for granted. The mind should be refined in a judicious process by higher sources in cooperation with the goal of imparting qualities of individual consciousness and developing imprints for vehicles of consciousness, not to develop a perfect, exactly perfect apparatus. As a confrontation with the abyss from the perspective of a mind that observes strange proje projections of the mind onto the total void, for example, when we happen to feel fear that needs to be overcome and conquered. We trigger terrifying scenes that we have seen in horror as they take flesh before our eyes and continue to terrorize our minds when we are completely empty and disciplined in the void work. There is not a trace of thought or image in positive emptiness. In other words, every image and thought form, every inclination and habit is reinforced, if not extinguished. It is easy to predict that when we die and our mind slowly goes out, the first thing that happens after death is the dissociation of image processing, in other words, the fragmented worlds of our mind falls apart, because this imprint of a mind slowly disintegrates after death as the consciousness is trapped in these projections and introjections. This is what the Buddhists called the intermediary stage of the bardo. Now there are psychopomps that assist in such transitions, the interzone, to other worlds and can penetrate fragments of the mind or introduce consciousness into a new astral vehicle, a new subtle mind and body. Likewise, there are planes, dimensions and domains that are psychoreactive and designed for various purposes in which the fragmented spirits can be trapped along with the conscious element and into which they are born. In the many years of my experience I have been a wearable suit, a medium, a ba baked, expansive, extremely self-aware mind for many entities, both demonic in nature, middle demonic, higher spirits, medium, low, and that of divinities, gods and souls. I was able to host even several entities in the temple of my body, each of them unaware of each other's presence. And while resisting being overpowered by the entities, I protected myself from injury and strengthened my will and voice. I witnessed those who supported me on my journey. It is a constant battle for the sovereignty of the will and mind. 
against inferior intelligences and lesser confused beings who are concerned with dominating or enforcing their flawed will. If you combat successfully with demonic forces and emerge victorious, they tend to listen to you and obey to your commands. They sought to gain total control over my body and mind, whether by violent, vulgar or viciously subtle means. Various strong powers and weaklings attempted to shrapnelize my mind. I emerged victorious. At the same time, they invited or welcomed higher intelligences as my beloved teachers, who wanted to expand my intelligence, my perception, my experience, my human nature, and my sense of divinity. Everything that your daemon finds natural is of the divine. Every violation against the will, mind, and nature is that of malignant scheming of petty pigs. I perceive the pressure in certain parts and cir circuits of the physical brain and central nervous system. I feel plenty of kinds of amplified energies, whether magnetic or otherwise. Learn about the characters and qualities of the gods, perverted and tempted, bestial beings as well. Feel the magnetic power of the gods as large as a city. Get infected by their power and abilities. Recognize their energetic forms and shapes. Ignited by various degrees of their strength and abilities. Perceiving the general feeling and wear of such assimilation that allowed me to research and write down actively and continuously afterwards. Open portals. Cast the abusers into hells. Destroy the piglets that try to overpower you. Introduction to Incarnations Any attribution of an objective reality to the intersubjective and subjective experiences, phenomenal but beyond the socialized and conditioned reasons, creates a subject-object relationship. It is not a matter of denying the possibility of an interdependent existence of certain being and dimensions, it is solely a matter of preserving reason, strength of will, of not becoming a slave to such a relationship. When you have your masters, kill them. A master in the realm of one's own mind is yourself only, which can confirm what truth might lie in the observations discovered, what knowledge and wisdom might be learned from the world and others. One avoids multiplying realities beyond what is necessary and does not allow oneself to be impressed and excited by things that some find anomalous, frightening, frightening or terrorizing but considers it as a rare gift to conquer, to expand and coalesce with the unmapped territory, gradually expanding one's own power and force of the posthumous diamond. Until adapted, we walk through it with skill, acumen and virtuosity. The aim of this walk is to provide an alternative framework for thinking about incarnations and possessions, avoiding the pitfalls of religious scripts and not letting the understanding of this phenomena revert to the Middle Ages, of so-called possession as the Abrahamic religions would like. First of all, I would like to emphasize that this document does not take up the semantically familiar term, and as a self-aware strong medium, I will refrain from criticizing such encounters, but rather focus on their understanding. Incarnation has been colonized as a concept by monotheistic religions and usually means to be dominated by a malevolent spirit that in fact stakes out the perspectives and divides the world into divine and evil, into light and darkness, which should be completely avoided. I prefer to observe this world with partially Hindi perception. I would like to illustrate it with a fragment from the work of Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa the great student of Johannes Tritemius, in which possessions, inhabitations and incarnations by lower, middle and higher spirits and intelligences are described, which subsequently leads to a modernized version of such understandings. This is chapter 60 by Agrippa of Madness and Divination. It happens also sometimes that not only they that are asleep but also that a watchful do what with a kind of instigation of mind divine, which divination Aristotle calls the ravishment, or a kind of madness and teaches that it proceeds from a melancholy humor, 
saying as treaties of divination. Melancholy, Saturnian melancholy, by reason of their earnestness, do far better conjecture and quickly conceive a habit, and most easily receive an impression of the celestials. And in his problem save that the Sibyls and the Bahids and Niceratus the Syracusan and Amund were by their nature Saturnally melancholic, complexion of prophets and poets. And so on, so on. So, to make it shorter, I will read on psychoreactives. What are psychoreactives? It's a unit, a series of tendencies, natures, whether in an integrated being, an extended field of consciousness, or a strange psychomorph, or a corrupted energy, an egregore, a god form, a magical field, or a current, a dimension, an independent entity, diamond, god, goddess, angel, archangel, focused in a ray, can be interpreted by the human mind. It reacts with the structure of the nervous system and influences both physiological, psychological and occulted pneumatic effects. Nature is a general inclination towards the substance of a being in its reality or dimension. Humans are taught to have six senses, if not more, including the mind, apart from magnetoreceptive and electroreceptive skills. Possibly others as enumerated by cities that is, the soul's abilities that are often translated back into the physical brain. There are entities that may have multiple senses and organs or apparatuses for contacts with their realities, not necessarily the ones we perceive, and they do not require biological backing. They may be basically disincarnate. Entities can at times integrate with, assimilate, modify, pervert, expand, regress, er, or evolve the human mind and brain, or be absorbed by the human mind, elongating their skills and senses. The regular biopsychological and physiological factors are considered as the basis for the functioning of the human organism. They explain the process in the regular cognitive sciences in an interconnectivist fashion, but are mutable and sometimes overridden by effective experiential and ethereal influences capable of altering the biochemistry, homeostasis, electrical conductivity in the neural structures, bioelectromagnetics, and the whole biological foundation of the organism, as well as its hidden skills and components. Ethereal natures of entities are not always compatible with individual character nor human beings producing weird perceptions, irregustos, or even madness, and in critical situations, atrocities. There are natures that are docile and expand our natural capacities, extending human nature to divinity, and those that set us back as something unnatural and strange or even bestial and inhumane. However, they do not walk in the void. We are not a tabula rasa, but a more or less uniformly formed human being with a priori circumstances and settings. Hence the natures that focus on us walk on our past memories, past experiences and inclinations, our hidden motives and deeds, addictions, attachments, emotions, bloodlines, spiritual lineages, genetics, thought carvings, mental habits. All of which can be read by certain natures for whom some things about us are as evident as to others hidden. We are all born into a certain socio-historical environment, into wealth of poverty, into education or lack of thereof, into moral and ethical upbringing or being on our own in this regard. We can be principled or generally loose and de or demoralized.